if, uh, if I'll ask the uh, AV people to clear the screens. Um, now we come to what is usually uh, the most emotional, at least for me, part of the, uh, the program each year, and that's the Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, this year it is uh, uh, somebody who um, I've known for a very long time and uh, has had a huge influence on my life. And because his uh, one, if not maybe two-thirds of his time, has been in dealing with, with forests and ecology and those things, we have asked the, uh, the Lifetime Achievement Award be presented by the Forest Service. Tom Tidwell had to be uh, in Colorado uh, the, tonight. So uh, Jim Reeves, who... I, 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 the way he was described to me is he's a forester's forester. Um, over 30 years with the Forest Service, has dealt with every issue of forestry that you can imagine and is sort of revered and is legendary within the Forest Service, is now head of uh, 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 research and development of the Forest Service. So let me ask uh, Jim Reeves to come to the stage and uh, to, to make the, uh, the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. Well, good evening. Here with you tonight. Chief Tidwell sends his regrets and best wishes for a successful conference for everybody. I'm here to introduce the iconic Dr. Stephen Hubble, this year's recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award. But before I do, I would like to say a few words about Forrest in the United States in their role in meeting the challenge of climate change. I commend you for advancing our knowledge of climate change and its impacts on natural resources. Like you, we at the U.S. Forest Service are deeply interested in finding renewable, re renewable energy sources and decreasing carbon, our carbon footprint. I appreciate this opportunity for dialogue in our mutual search for solutions. The United States has the fourth largest forest estate in the world behind Brazil, Russia, and Canada. About a third of our land area is forested. We have a little more than 300 million uh, hectare acres of forest. Our forest types run a gamut from boreal forests in Alaska to temperate forests that covers most of our land area and to tropical forests in Hawaii and Puerto Rico. We manage forests in the United States for all benefits that people get from them. Our forests provide tremendous biodiversity. And for example, the Southern Appalachian Mountains is a vast biodiversity hotspot. Our forests also furnish more than half of our surface water supply. In the western United States, 65% of our water supply comes from our forests. Another, another critical ecosystem service from forests is carbon uptake and storage. Forests in the United States are a net carbon sink. They take up about 12% of the carbon uh, emissions in our country that people emit each year. Forests also store vast quantities of carbon, mainly in living biomass and in soils, but also in the form of wood as a green building material. In addition, the United States generates growing amounts of woody biomass as a renewable resource of energy. The U.S. Forest Service uses woody biomass for heating some of our own buildings, thus offsetting fossil fuels and reducing our carbon footprint. Forests in the United States face growing threats from uncharacteristically severe wildfires 
and outbreaks of insects and disease. Both are related to the effects of a changing climate on our forests. In response, the U.S. Forest Service is taking steps to keep our forests healthy and resilient. We are helping ecosystems adapt to, eco to the effects of climate change by restoring more of our open forest structure and fire adapted forest types, such as our ponderosa pines. We're also taking actions to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions by facilitating carbon uptake and storage through reforestations, and that's just one example. These approaches are linked. So long as forest ecosystems can adapt to the effects of a changing climate, we all know that they will help mitigate climate change by taking up and storing vast quantities of carbon in trees and wood products and forest soils. Our central goal is to restore the ability of forests and grassland ecosystems to resist climate-related stresses, recover from climate-related disturbances, and to continue to deliver all the ecosystem services that our citizens want and all ecosystem services that our citizens need. The U.S. Forest Service is, leading forest, is the leading forestry organization in the United States. Directly or indirectly, we play a role in managing about 80% of our nation's forests. The Forest Service also has one of the largest research organizations in the world dedicated solely to conservation, and we have worked with Dr. Hubble on tropical forestry research. And I can say I'm proud to lead our research research organization. We have great scientists and we have great staff. Now, to the introduction of our distinguished awardee, Dr. Stephen Hubble. Last year, and many of you probably attended, we co-hosted the annual meeting of the International U Union of Forest Research Organizations in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, at that meeting, Dr. Hubble received the IUFRO uh, Host Country Scientific Achievement Award. No American has won this award in more than 40 years. IUFRO praises Dr. Hubble as, and let me, and I quote, a visionary scientist who has made unparalleled contributions to understanding the biological diversity and ecology of tropical forests. He is an international leader in advancing our scientific understanding of complex tropical ecosystems. Dr. Hobel is a distinguished professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of California, Los Angeles. Previously, he held positions at the University of Georgia, Princeton University, the University of Michigan, and the University of Iowa, Iowa and uh, a position at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Dr. Harbo is the co-founder and founding chair of the National Council for Science and the Environment. Through, NS, through NCSE, he has strengthened the connections between science and decision making in many areas, between scientists and policymakers, managers, conservationists, and business leaders, both within the United States and around the world. This conference is a part of Dr. Hubble's legacy. Dr. Hubble has published four books, more than 200 scientific papers on tropical plant ecology, theoretical ecology, plant-animal uh, interaction, and uh, animal behavior. He has unified the neutral theory of biodiversity and bio, uh, biogeography, explained the diversity and re, uh, relative abundance of species and ecological communities. Dr. Hubble, Dr. Hubble was awarded the Guggen, a Guggenheim, Guggenheim Fellowship in 1984 and was a, pre, a Pew Scholar in Conservation and Environment from 1990 to 1992. 
a position he used to support NCSE. In 1992, he received the Distinguished National Service Award from the Society of Conservation Biology. He is a member of Phi Beta Kappa, Sigma Xi, and is a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science. Please, please join me in recognizing Dr. Hubble for the Lifetime Achievement Award granted by the National Council for Science and the Environment. Dr. Hubble, would you please come forward? here for Dr. Hubble. It's the National Council for Science and the Award to Dr. Stephen Hubble for major contributions to the world's understanding of ecology and biodiversity and for the advancing the connections between science, conservation, and policy. January 28, 2015. Wow. Thank you. Uh, it's an inside job, you realize. Uh, but I still am very grateful. Thank you, Peter, and all of NCSE for this award. And I'd like to say a few uh, things about my reflections at the 15th conference of how we've changed and how we've matured. When we started out, I was, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. And I was at Princeton University and a colleague of mine, Henry Howe and I, were dissatisfied with the state of connection of science to policy. And we said, you know, we need also better science because there are huge holes in what we understand about environmental issues that need plugging, and nobody's really talking about these lacunae. So we organized a meeting in Washington that was funded by uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson, and we invited Tom Lovejoy and other people to this meeting to discuss what to do about it. And we wrote a white paper, very controversial white paper, which said that we needed to think about a National Institutes for the Environment modeled on the NIH. Very ambitious idea. And we took this to Congress, and in those days Congress worked better than it does now. And we had a bill, not too long after that, uh, with about 140 co-sponsors to create the National Institutes for the Environment. Well, not long after that, the agencies heard about this, and they got really scared because the last thing they wanted was for their science to be stripped out of their agencies. So after struggling along for a while as the National Council for Science, no, we were the, uh, we were the uh, CNIE, the, the Committee for the National Institutes of the Environment, we reinvented ourselves as the NCSE and said that we'd succeeded in our role of promoting a connection between science and the environment. And this was very convenient because we weren't going to get the National Institutes for the Environment, at least not yet. Still a good idea. I hope all of you agree. <laughs> so I haven't totally given up. But let me re reflect briefly on our history. After we launched uh, this organization, we were very naive about how Washington worked. And I have to say we were very naive beyond the narrow confines of the science that we did about how to connect science to policy. And so partly this is reflected in my own education about this organization. Our motto is improving the scientific basis for environmental decision making. But we're much more than that now. 
perhaps our motto ought to be modified to improving the scientific and socioeconomic basis of environmental decision making. Because we, at this meeting, talked more about sustainable communities and connecting communities to distributed energy and things of that sort, which were never on our mind back when. And I have to say this is a, a magnificent transformation because this is where the action is. Our science is still inadequate. There are huge holes, I know, in my own field of tropical forest ecology where we do not have answers about how to conserve tropical forests. Uh, let me give you one statistic, which I gave at the I IUFRO conference. In our global network of about 60, 50 hectare plots, we have almost 25% of the described tree species of the world in them, not individuals, but species. But of those 8,500, half of them, 4,250, make up less than 2% of the individuals. So, in fact, conserving tropical forests is about saving extremely rare species. How are we going to do that? We have no clue. So I leave you with the thought that we need a sustainable connection between science and policy. And so I want you all to believe in NCSE and its mission and to help support its continuance because we continue, we're, we're unlike any other organization in Washington. We do not take positions on environmental issues. We talk about what we know and what we don't know and how to get the information that we need. And that is our mission. And so Republicans and Democrats and all stripes of politicians can agree to talk about what we need to find out in order to move forward. That is the reason for our success story, is that we focus on getting information. Now, I have to say, there are people out there who are not interested in getting information. In fact, who are disseminating disinformation. And I think this is the white elephant in the room. We don't talk about how to deal with the people who are evil and sowing misinformation. And I think that that is one of the major socioeconomic issues that we have to confront. Now, NCSE does that in a gentle way, but it needs to be more forceful. So if I make recommendations for the future of NCSE, it is that we need to talk about truth in advertising, what it is that we say and the evidence. We need to be evidence-based and talk about the evidence. If we do that, we're on safe ground ethically and scientifically. And I want to say that this is the most ethical and most honest organization that I've ever had the joy of being part of, and I hope it continues for a very long time. And I have one final comment. This is a hard organization to fundraise for, and so one of the things that we're going to be doing over the next several years is trying to build an endowment. We're not the National Resource Defense Council, which has millions and millions of dollars. We're an amazingly effective group for our tiny size. And so what I'm asking you to do is put your thinking caps on about how to raise endowment funds for us. And if you have any hot ideas or know any tame billionaires, please have them contact Peter Sondry, our executive director. Thank you for your attention, and thank you for this award. Now I know why Steve wouldn't tell me what he was going to say this evening. <laughs> <laughs>